warning. We're about to spoil historical events between 2001 and 2012. If you haven't lived through that time or studied any history books, leave now and come back later. But if you have, or you just don't care, then please stick around. Was that the joke? I just kind of a joke opening as well because okay, I I don't know what else to joke about with war. I don't either. <clears throat> war is bad and it makes me sad. No, we can't steal from Auntie Donna. They have copyright on that. Yeah, I know. Value I, Select does not. I wasn't even suggesting that. I was just referencing it. <laughs> Value Select does not. <laughs> Hello, everybody, and. Welcome to Cinema Roulette. That intro right there is about as excited as you're going to hear me throughout this entire review. Hi. Hi. Justin is also here. We're also here with our first Catherine Bigelow movie. Yep. And boy, what a one to start out with. Hmm. We're recording on the 4th of July. Yeah. Even though it just turned the uh, 5th. But, oh. On the... West Coast, it's still 4th of July. True. Still technically where uh, you live is 4th of July. So. True, as well. <laughs> yep. Mm. But we're in person for this, because yeah. we're recording movie month. <laughs> which we can't spoil this episode. Yup, we're going to have to try our best to be like, oh, like in that one movie. Platoon. Platoon. Oh, shit! <laughs> Damn it! Anyway, uh, Zero Dark Thirty. And I think that's enough silence. Uh, <laughs> oh, thank God. Okay. Anyway, sorry. The silence is holding us hostage. Uh, <laughs> My brain was going to say the silence was deafening, which is why I couldn't breathe. You know, because it's deafening. Because it's deaf, yes. Because I'm, I'm deafened by it, which means <laughs> I can't breathe. God damn it. Okay. Ah, yes. Just breathe through your ears. It's easy. <laughs> Just put the oxygen well, right... Well, that's how you pop your ears, technically. I guess so, but yeah, just put that oxygen directly into your brain. No lungs needed. <laughs> Get up in there. Big brain moment. Yeah. Get that shit high as a kite. Exactly. <laughs> Sorry, I was remembering Futurama. Anyway. Nice. Uh, we need to talk about Zero Dark Thirty. Okay. So, hey, remember when we talked about we need to talk about Kevin? That's not this situation, technically. Yeah. Because that movie was told insanely out of order, so it was kind of hard to uh, summarize. Yes. This movie is not told out of order, but it's literally just a list of historical events. It is a list and basically essentially a dramatization of yeah. actual historical events. So And apparently not super dramatized. Yeah. They, from what I heard, stayed fairly accurate. There were a couple of historical inaccuracies, like um, there was a different language instead. They had them speaking Arabic, even though there's a different language that in that area they speak. Uh, we're stupid white Americans. We wouldn't know. Yeah, and there's a couple other historical inaccuracies, but um, especially the nighttime raid at the end, that was apparently very accurate to what happened. So, And also the main character of uh, Maya? Yes. Uh, is a combination of a bunch of people Correct. rather than just... Yeah, that they never existed. Basic what? Guess what just came on Netflix for free? Zero Dark Thirty. No, you're kidding me. <laughs> we we rented this movie, and as we're recording, is now free on Netflix. <laughs> well, I may as well have just taken those four dollars and took a lighter to them. <laughs> hey, you paid ones only working. Like one of the handful of female directors working in Hollywood. That so is also true. Feel I good guess about I can that. Do that. So <laughs> really hits you right in the heartstrings. But yes, Zero Dark Thirty. We will, I guess, summarize the events. I'm not going to. Like, okay, it it covers the event. Well, it opens with 9/11, sort of. We just hear uh, like news chatter and phone calls mm-hmm. from the time. Then we jump to the first interrogations in 2003. We see. I forget where the first shooting happens. The, like, hotel. Oh, fuck. Because um, that was in 2005, I want to say. Yeah. Saudi Arabia? Maybe. maybe? Something like that. Uh, but then we have a uh, the British bus bombing of 08. 
We also mention uh, the attempt at shoe bombing on a plane and eventually get to the assassination of Osama bin Laden. Yep. When we went in there and um, it was actually not called Zero Dark Thirty. Zero Dark Thirty is a military term. It was called Operation Neptune Spear, which is awesome. Which is just a cooler name. Yeah. <laughs> at, oh, uh, hmm. there's a instant fun fact. Okay. Because uh, I was just pulling that up to give us a bit more to talk about to pad out the episode. Uh, the movie was originally about the unsuccessful decade-long manhunt for Osama bin Laden, but got completely rewritten after bin Laden was killed. Mm-hmm. Yeah, <clears throat> and actually, it goes back even further than that, because <clears throat> according to Wikipedia, uh, Bigelow and Bull initially worked on and finished a screenplay centered on the December 2001 Battle of Tora Bora and the long, un- yeah, well, and the long unsuccessful efforts to find bin Laden. The two were about to begin filming when news broke bin Laden had been killed. They immediately shelved the film they'd been working on and redirected their focus, essentially started from scratch. That's impressive. Yeah, honestly. And again, this is like, we don't even get much about the character of Maya Mm -hmm. as a person. It's very much focused on this hunt and the events. Yeah, on recreating the events. Um, Another fun fact here, along with uh, painstakingly recreating the historic night vision raid on the compound, the script in the film stressed the little reported role of the tenacious young female CIA officer who tracked down uh, Bin Laden. The screenwriter said that while, we're, while researching for the, for the film, I heard through the grapevine that women played a big role in the CIA in general and on this team. I heard that a woman was there on the night of the raid as one of the CIA's liaison officers on the ground, and that was the start of it. Um, he then turned up stories about a young case officer who was recruited out of college who spent her entire career chasing bin Laden. Uh, Maya's tough-minded, uh, monomaniacal persona, Bull said, is based on a real person, but she also represents the work of a lot of other women. Okay. So, that's where that kind of came about, so. <laughs> yeah, I'm wondering where to start with this movie. Yeah, I'll, since we brought up the characters, let's start there, because I think... That is one of the film's biggest problems, is that it can't decide if it wants to be a character piece or if it wants to just dramatize the events. Yeah, it it doesn't really give us an anchor to work on other than just following the timeline. Yeah. Like, stuff happens to Maya, like one of her close friends dies, but that's, like, about all we get of that, really. uh, That's brushed over pretty quickly. The soldiers treat her kind of like a dicks but yeah. one of them's chris pratt so it's not surprising i mean yeah but <laughs> the worst chris <laughs> yeah and um i want to say just before we actually really dive into um what uh, what the movie and just our thoughts on it i want to say that we didn't really enjoy it all that much but it might just not be for us honestly yeah this so. is a movie where i will admit like cinematography wise yeah. looks great the acting even though the characters aren't super focused on Everyone does a fantastic yeah, job. Everyone does a good job. We don't hate this movie. It's just, it's not our thing, really. And I probably will never watch it again, honestly. It's like so. an hour too long. Yeah, it is. So, But we will get to that. So, But anything else you want to say on the characters? Uh, character one, I do like somewhat of the tiny arc um, Maya has. Mm-hmm. Where you see her go from someone who does... who does still have sympathy and is worried about the people they're torturing, but by the end is just kind of broken by the system. Yeah. And that catching Bin Laden, like, leaves her as a shell because that's all she's been doing for about a decade. Yeah, and there is a little moment in the film where they're like, you know, protect your homeland or whatever, just give up the Bin Laden case. It didn't pan out or whatever because we couldn't find the person because he died, and she's like, no, I'm not doing this because that was just basically her whole reason for existing. So Yeah, that was the whole reason yeah. for her job for, the again, the past decade. And I think that, like, that scene, too, where um, in the restaurant with her one friend that was supposed to, like, be um i guess like add to that too because she was like you know you've been overworking yourself you've been focusing on this case like you look terrible have you had any downtime to yourself or anything so she basically spent her entire life chasing bin laden that when she's told not to she can't (laughs) so yeah and then she finally gets and then it's like what now and then just end yeah it just kind of ends so that's pretty well done like we said the cinematography is really really gorgeous like it's not like like you know like very stack shot. It is like a lot of like shaky cam, a lot of handheld shots, but it's not to the point where it's distracting. You can tell what's going on. And you can see kind of the vibe they were trying to pull from the scenes. Yeah, they were trying to get that documentary feel to it. Yeah, 
And also, I'll give it this. Even though we're dealing with the grim subject of fucking terrorism, we keep color here. Yes. It's not just completely desaturated, really bleak. There's actual color here. And the way the cities are represented is really nice, too. Yeah, because we're in the... (laughs) We're in a foreign land and we don't just shade everything fucking yellow. Yeah, we don't just shade everything yellow or show like the desert or something. No, there are towns and it's inhabited with people and it's very colorful, very crowded. Yeah, you see that, you know, these are places where people live. It's not just a giant war zone. Yeah. (laughs) Which I'm sure we'll also see with uh, Catherine Bigelow when we get to the Hurt Locker. She seems to have a very, try to have a very neutral stance when showing everything. It's like, here's what happened. Here's what's going on. Take it as you will. Yeah. And The Hurt Locker, I still think, is a much better movie than this. It's, and I think it's also only like an hour and a half, two hours, isn't it? I think so. I don't think it's that long, but it, I do find it a much stronger film. <laughs> yeah, this movie could have had three minutes cut, yeah. if I'm being honest. You want to get into that a little bit? Yeah, we can go into some a- like actual criticism. Yeah, because like by the time stuff is actually starting to happen, and like by the time the movie actually starts to pick up, it, it, we're an hour and a half into the movie. Yeah, we're 90 like, minutes in. We're basically an entire movie length until we actually get to, like, the action, kind of the everything culminating to the nighttime raid on Bin Laden's compound. And before that stuff happened, like, little bursts of action happened, but I think one of the movie's problems is just it, it could have been edited down so much because there are scenes that just kind of go on. Yeah, there's a lot of just saying around, like, well... What's our next lead? Well, I have this thing. It's just these long silences. And I get you're trying to be realistic, but also I have things to do. Yeah. And I get you're like trying to get enveloped in the world and show off the cares and stuff. But there are times where it's just literally the camera's there and we cut shots and they're just standing around waiting. Like it just stuff keeps going on. We just show off the scenery. It's like, God, do something. (laughs) I got very bored very fast with it just because of that. And you actually made a very good comparison to Jarhead uh, when we were talking about it. Yes, because uh, <clears throat> Jarhead is also a war movie, and it's a, also about the war in the Middle East. But And there's a lot of downtime in that movie, too. But that's to show the mental state of soldiers and how this isn't no, no longer wars of, like, in the trenches shooting at one. Or it's a lot of fucking waiting, a lot of intel. And then you go, and then all of a sudden action will happen yeah. when you're least prepared. But there, it's like to actually get in the mind of a soldier and psychologically, you know, evaluate all that. Here, it's just we're depicting the events as they happen. That's which, it. Which I get also there. Yeah. That is realistically what happens. They sit around, and wait for information. Yeah. But there's a point where it's like, okay, we get it. <laughs> yeah. Just get on with it. <laughs> Yeah, the movie's just, I feel just over long. I like it could have, like, there could have been at least half an hour cut out of this movie. Either that, or it need, even if it would be more of a dramatization than realistic, it needed more interesting dialogue. Yes. The dialogue isn't bad by any means, but it needed more back and forth to have those scenes feel entertaining, I guess. The only really bad line I can think of is, I'm not one of those girls that likes to fuck, or something like that, or that fucks. <laughs> <laughs> she said that I was like the fuck <laughs> wasn't that to Chris Pratt's character or no it was to her friend earlier on in the movie she's oh, like oh right right I'm not one of those girls that fucks I'm like <laughs> what <laughs> it was so off guard <laughs> it did but yeah that that happened but yeah it's just yeah it, didn't, it just needed a more interesting script I think you're right about that yeah also I understand the tension of the one scene where the friend gets blown up. Yeah. I understand the tension was like, oh, don't listen to the... Uh, can you not do this protocol so that way he'll actually come in? As soon as you said that, as soon yeah. as this scene decided to hold on a shot of the car coming in for like two minutes, it's going to kill her. We all know it. That was the biggest problem is I could see exactly where the scene was going. Yeah, there was no tension here. It was even further back for me because I realized when she was getting everyone together, she's like, okay, team, we've got this. My contact is on his way. Now you're going to do this and you're going to do this. And she's talking with Maya, who is comfortably sitting behind a desk and not in the action. Yeah, so, miles away. Yep. So I, I saw this coming from a fucking mile away. Well, yeah, it was like you kind of see it there. But as soon as she's like, oh, can yeah. you not do protocol? It's like, well, you're dead. <laughs> you just like, fucked up. Yeah. 
Uh, so that scene just lost any and all tension when that happened. <laughs> actually, apparently in that scene, a black cat runs in front of the car mm-hmm. to hint that it's bad. Are you fucking kidding I'm serious. Me? It's a movie fact. <laughs> That's just dumb. <laughs> actually... I guess this isn't a positive or negative. It's what the movie's going for. Mm-hmm. You feel how fucking useless the U.S. is. Oh, yeah. Like, I don't know if that's what they're going for, but you just feel like all the red tape they're going through. Because there's a scene where they're sitting, like, making action or whatever. And he points out, like, this house is very suspicious. This, Like, they're doing all this security. You can't see in from the top. You can't see in from the bottom. And we found out that there's a third person who just goes under the awning, can hide his tracks. Someone's cle- hiding out here, and someone is important. Like, statistically, this has to be Bin Laden. And they come back with, oh, well, it could be this, but we actually don't actually have visual confirmation. And then they break, and then they come back, and then they also decide, oh, well, it isn't worth acting on. <laughs> yeah, we see that it took... Like, they know this location for over a hundred days yeah. and don't jump on it. She, like, goes to the guy's wall and writes every single day <laughs> that they don't do anything. And the moment of the soldiers actually going in and when dude gets Bin Laden, yeah. the seeing him shocked at that he did it yeah. w- is actually, that is a solid moment. That's, like, one of the better moments of the movie. Yeah. Like, you can see that he still can't process. Like, it all happened so fast, and all just happened, bam, bam, bam. Because the action is very, very realistic. I'll give it that. But just bam, bam, he's like, he's still in this belief. He's like, I shot Bin Laden. Like, he's like, dude, do you realize what you just did? Like, (laughs) Yeah, like, they could have had this whole dramatized thing of, like, you know, busting the door in slow-mo and then shooting, and you see the bullet go to his head. But no, it's very much like, oh, there's a guy behind that door. He has a gun. Bang. Bang. That's it. Down. Um, and I, that's another thing I'll give it. The action, when it happens, is good. And the gun effects were actually really solid. Like, yeah. that was a realistic-sounding silencer. It wasn't just pew, pew, pew. Yeah. It, in case you don't know, if you put a silencer on a pistol, it sounds like a weak pistol. Yeah. If you put it on a rifle, it sounds like a pistol. Yeah. <laughs> Basically. Basically. So, I actually did appreciate that. And when, like, and I liked that, like, b- b- um, the the difference between, like, the uh, people in Bin Laden's compound and the U.S., uh, forces or whatever um that like you all their guns were silenced well yeah when they get shot they're like bang 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 and you can just feel the punchiness of the weapons yeah <laughs> and it's not afraid to show that yeah we just executed two people a uh, guy and a girl and there's their kids crying in the corner like we're not afraid to show that yeah we just totally robbed all these kids of their parents and then the marines are trying to tell them it's fine it's fine <laughs> heroes heroes uh <clears throat> So, yeah, just overall, I just feel it's such a mixed bag of a movie. I just... I, the I, last 30 minutes are great. Yeah, last 30 minutes are fine. I really enjoyed that, but I have a hard time recommending it because of that. It's just, I feel like that's not worth it, honestly. Yeah, so, for a two and a half hour movie, it's not worth yeah. that runtime. And you said something about, like, if your movie's two and a half hours, you either have to, like, fill it or just cut it down or something, right? Yeah, like, if you hit two and a half hours... 70% of the time, you can cut out 10 minutes or yeah. 20. Yep. And this movie 100% could cut out a lot. It, it definitely needed it. So, um, But yeah, the positives was there. I can see why the Academy liked it. It was very much an Academy movie, like if we're being I can honest. see why people like it, too. Yeah, I can see the draw. It's just, it's really not our thing. It's so. really not. Um, I will also say, because you mentioned this to me, how... Some people thought this was pro-torture. Yeah, that's actually another thing we can delve into, because it's not afraid to show the horrible torture we did to people. (laughs) Yeah. No, this isn't pro-torture. If you see this as like, oh, this is a positive look out on torture. Like, yes, they got some information out of it, but also we have physically broken a human being and they are going to die in here. Yeah, exactly. Like, it's it's fucked up. And if you look at that and go, yeah, you're fucked up. (laughs) Like, Yeah, like, it's a... It's not played as cool. It's not yeah. played as, as like, this was the right thing. It's played as, here is tor- torture of a human being. Yeah, here's torture of a human being, and here's the prick who's doing it. <laughs> so, and it's very messed up. Like, they break him physically, mentally, and do some really weird fucked up shit. I mean, even the head guy of the torture, he uh, quits the case. Yeah. Before even the halfway point, because he's just fucked. He's just done with it. He's like, you know, I've been doing this for a while. I've seen too many naked guys. I'm just done. <laughs> I don't need this anymore. Yeah. (laughs) 
But yeah, I, I do like that about because that was one of the films like that was a thing a lot of people remember because a lot of people thought it was excessive or disturbing. It's like that's kind of the point is to show that we did this to people. Yeah, that's what we did. <laughs> yeah, it, exactly. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, it's just I don't know. It's just props to Catherine Bigelow for doing it and for doing it like so soon after Bin Laden got killed or whatever. And I, I, I respect the statement that it made, but it's just overall I feel it's too slow, too much of a mixed bag and just not really my thing. Yeah, so. it's just not my thing. Yeah. And if you enjoy it, great. I'm glad you did. You got more out of it than I did. <laughs> yeah, I'm not Again, this isn't a movie where I'm going to be like, yeah, how the fuck did you enjoy it? I get it. No, I get it. I get what the draw is. It's just, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's not what I'm looking for. Nope. <laughs> So, yes, now that Zero Dark Thirty is out of the way, shall we? Uh, if my computer doesn't crash, yeah. Oh, <laughs> that that would be an issue. Yeah, I just went full white screen while I tried to <laughs> set up the thing. But it's good now. Yay! <laughs> okay, so we are still on the director's wheel. This is our last spin on the director's wheel before we jump back to the series, uh, the sellout wheel, which is called the sellout wheel because we have movies on it that your friends have heard so you can easily plug us yes but first the director's wheel which has a bunch of director sign i know very complicated <laughs> i don't even know how many movies we have left on this i didn't count <laughs> but we're gonna we're gonna do the, the thing the thing <gasps> okay it is time to what are we doing the wheel uh-huh uh-huh <gasps> spin <laughs> do it do what did you spin it? I didn't. Please, come on. Please what? Spin. Yeah! Okay, we're sticking with Catherine Bigelow, actually. Oh, really? What'd we get? Uh, we're going to see her movie Blue Steel. Ooh, okay. <laughs> which I think has Jamie Lee Curtis in it, if I remember correctly. I do not know, but yeah, so Blue Steel. This okay. was one we added to replace a Kurosawa movie. Yep. Because someone might have put too many on the wheel. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. Jamie Lee Curtis. Boom. I remember yep. things. Yay. From 1989. And Clancy Brown, apparently. So. Who's Clancy Brown again? Mr. Krabs, the Kirkin. Right. <laughs> I knew the name. I just forgot why. It's all good. <laughs> the man who apologized to nuns. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, we'll do Blue Steel next. So, I know nothing about this movie. Neither do I. So this will be interesting. I think I honestly read the plot and went, yeah, that sounds dumb and yep. fun. All right. So, so we'll see if it's that. Yes. So we will stay tuned, everybody, for Blue Steel. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 